Amen. Let's stand up and worship tonight. Been looking forward to being with you here all day. Um, worshiped in my car Man. for several hours today on the road. And, uh, you know, I always look forward to worshiping with you too. I hope that today uh, this isn't the first time you've worshiped. Amen. I hope that it's uh, a part of your life. Uh, and that God is moving in your life all the time. And if he's not, here's what I'm telling you. He can be, all right? So let's just trust the Lord tonight to do great things here. And let's worship him like this is the last time we'll worship him before glory. Amen? Somebody's already took their shoes off. There's a pair of sandals up here on the floor. On holy ground. All right. Let's pray then let's enter into his presence father in jesus name we trust you tonight just to invade the places that we won't let nobody else in god for we know that you can shine a light and that you are good that your mercy endures forever lord we need you right now and we need you in the life of our church and in the lives of these people here they've come here tonight for a reason for a purpose to find you to see you and even if they don't understand it God you've brought them here for a reason and purpose so God let all of that come to the forefront here and let us just enjoy this time together Lord just uh, giving you all that praise that you deserve Father we don't we can't even uh, scrape the top of it God it's just so amazing that you are so amazing that you are good but we can't say how good you are enough Lord thank you for the grace of this day let tonight be no different thank you for what you're going to do in this place through the power of your Holy Spirit save those who need you God those in this room who have never given their heart and lives to you God let that happen here fill us with the Holy Spirit Father let this place just be full let people feel you and know you. God, if there's someone here right now that doesn't know you, let them sense your presence. God, fill the air, fill the atmosphere here tonight as we worship you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Be the fire inside 
good he is You are good You're good Oh, keep singing You are good You're good You know, in whatever situation you're going through, that God is good and Jesus is better than that situation. Just stand on Him. Because when you stand on Him, the rest of the world can crumble and fall. But you'll always have a sure footing. I promise you tonight, Jesus is the answer. Because He's better than anything else this world offers. Better make my heart believe. 
us, Lord, have all. Glory, glory, we have no other King but Jesus, Lord, have all. We raise the anthem, our loudest praises ring, we crown Him Lord of all. about you but I'm a little bit excited about my Jesus and if you're not you need to figure out what Jesus you got because <laughs> mine's the one to get excited about and my hope is built on nothing less you know what let all that's around us crumble and fall when there's a the last man standing it'll be Jesus I can promise you that you know the big deal about my Jesus is this in the end he comes in with a double-edged sword riding a big white horse and everything in his way goes down except for those who are with him. So when all of this is said and done and all these worries and all these things that are trying to choke the life out of us right now, when all of this is said and done, he is victorious and we reign forever, forever will we rule and reign with him. You listening to me? with him forever we will be with him ruling and reigning and living the life that god wanted us to live from the very beginning All, god never had any of this mess planned for us okay but when we messed it up we got what we needed to get but one day as he's in the process right now of redeeming all of that if you know christ if he is your cornerstone if you are only if your hope is only in the shed blood of Jesus Christ and his righteousness then you'll spend eternity with him don't bank on it if you're trying to do it yourself but if you are in him and he is in you and his righteousness has been given to you the glory that's to come will be greater than anything you will ever experience this side of eternity there's something to look forward to and that's why I praise him now hey I don't know what's going on in your life but I can promise you, whatever storm you're in, he is Lord of all. No. 
shall come with trumpet sound. Oh, then I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone. Faultless stand before the throne. Let's sing that again. You better know him. When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless than before the Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong in the Savior's love. But through the storm, He is Lord, Lord of Just one more. How about one more? There you go. All right, just one more. I know y'all got places to go and people to see, but let's. Uh, just been thinking about, you know, if it, if it's his breath in our lungs, we'll be in the key of E. I just think about how much more he deserves than what he's getting from us, and even when we're doing the best we can, he deserves so much more. And this time we've got here tonight, I just want to give him the praise he deserves. And let's sing to the Lord. You give life, you are love. You bring light to the darkness. You give hope. You restore every heart that is broken. Great are you, Lord. Sing it out. It's your breath. It's your breath. In our love.
greater than we are for we know our greatness has nothing to do with how good we are but how good you are within us father god we know that you are bringing all these things about in this place and through these people that are here tonight god for your glory and your glory alone so father god let everybody uh, flourish where you've planted them father god let them be seeds that are willing vessels just to do what you want them to do and be what you'd have them to be God and let their lives Father God flourish in the garden that you've planted them in Lord Jesus that we might see the fruit of our labors God here on this side of eternity with many many souls coming into your kingdom Father you are great and we know Father the only reason you've put this breath in us that we might breathe it for you and Lord we just ask you God Lord, just to prepare us, Father God, for this next step, Father, for this next place, for these next people, Lord. Lord, we trust you, Father God. We trust you to do what we can't do, Father. Lord, we trust you just to bring labors into the harvest, God, and show us the fields that are already ripe, the, the fruit, the low-hanging fruit, God, that we can go ahead and pull in, God, while we are working on that, Father, which is still at the top of the tree. God, let us see the neighborhoods and the, the the people groups father god let us see all that you're trying to do in this area and through these people god and thank you god for your presence father god for your presence makes all the difference in the world lord we know that we are not able to save anyone god we know we are not able to draw anyone or call anyone without your holy spirit's presence so let it be strong tonight 
in the heart of everyone here and in the mouth of every teacher here, God. Let them speak not as if I've got to teach this class, but as if thus saith the Lord Jesus. Let tonight be a night of power in your spirit and let people's lives be changed, God. We pray that tonight, Father God, that you've been glorified in this place. Lord, we trust you, Lord. And we love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You can be seated. Got a offering that we're going to take up at this time for our van ministry. Last week we went to Amos, but we're going back uh, to the book of Matthew chapter 6 this week. And I want to talk to you a little bit about these prayers that we are praying. We've, I want to, we don't have a lot of time, which we got as much time as we need, but some of those uh, teachers with your kids won't, won't agree with me there. So <laughs> when somebody says, when Ashley goes, are you ready to go to class? All the parents are like, yeah! <laughs> you know? And like the kids are like, what are y'all so excited? 20 minutes away from you. It's almost time to give you to the teachers. <laughs> uh, be praying for our teachers. All of our teachers and our staff and all of the people from the very top to the very bottom. They all have influence. I uh, heard about a, a man who is very successful. Um, I can't even say his last name. It starts with a V. Vujicic. Nix. Vujicic something. And he, uh, if you look him up on the internet, you can't miss it. Just put Nick V and type in no arms or legs beside it. He will come up. He was born with no arms, no legs. And he said that his school janitor was the most influential person in his life in saying, like he was going to be an accountant, he thought, because of all these things in his, you know, in his life, the people in his life. And the janitor said, you're going to be a public speaker and your story is going to show people, millions of people. And he has talked to 200 million people in a day's time live on TV. Now, God used a janitor to speak a word of knowledge into his life. He heard that word. He received it, and he thought, ah, maybe, that's okay, but he's just a crazy janitor. And then God used him in such a way that he just, he, he talked to us at this men's deal we went to this weekend. It was amazing, the, the word of God that he was able to speak. He has a quarter of a foot is all he has. He has two toes on it. He has no arms, uh, no legs. He has a wife with two children, and he speaks to millions of people a year uh, in the world and tells them about the Jesus that he has in his heart that has changed his life forever. So I just want to encourage you school teachers, you might not think that you're getting anywhere. And most of the time by the end of the year, you're ready to get out of there. Because uh, I was a kid one time driving y'all crazy. I know how this works. But there could be one sentence you say in a child's lifetime that steers them towards the things of God in such a way <laughs> that millions of people could be saved by your influence one day, in one time, one minute. And, and I know the school systems have their idea about what we can and what we can't do. Um, but I know, you're, I know the man over the school systems, um, and Mark Florence, he ain't going to reprimand you for speaking the name of Jesus. So you go ahead and speak it. If they don't like it, you send them to me. If they don't like it, I'll send them to Mark Florence. <laughs> you know. Don't be afraid to speak the name of Jesus to anybody at any time, at any place. And I, I want to encourage the teachers tonight uh, before we leave. And we've got a few other prayer requests that were asked that we, uh, we give our uh, time to for just a few minutes. But in Matthew chapter 6, we've been talking about what the disciples gave themselves in Acts chapter 2. They gave themselves to devotion, uh, like the teaching of the apostles. They did not have the scripture like we had it. So when it means the teaching of the apostles, it literally means the literal teaching. They were listening to them every day. And as God gave the apostles the word of God, then they adhered to the word of God. Uh, then things started being written down. But we see the lessons that they learned. They gave themselves to the apostles' teaching. Uh, they gave themselves to fellowship. It's so important. You cannot be right with God and not go to church. When I say that, I'm talking about fellowship. I'm talking about in the way that you do it. Hebrews talks about that there is those who assemble and that until the day of Christ's return, we are to assemble more and more in order to encourage each other. And it says 
uh, as, as they do it. Whoever, whatever group that is you're meeting with, if they do it on Tuesdays and Thursdays or Sundays and Fridays, whatever that is, you're to be faithful to the place that God has planted you, that you may bloom in that garden and give God the glory in that place where he's put you. You've got to have fellowship. We are not islands unto ourself. Community. The early church was a complete community. We've got to see that. We have to live in each other's lives, not live separate from each other, but like Jesus sharing the hurts, the, the, the pains, the sorrows, the joys. We laugh when you laugh. We cry when you cry. If you need it, I sell it. I give it to you. The church had need of nothing during this time because everybody was so generous. They were just giving and giving and giving. They lived with each other. They didn't just know each other from a distance. They did everything together. I love that type of model. I think the church is strongest in community, and it's at its weakest when we try to operate alone. They gave yourself to that. They gave yourself to the Lord's Supper. We talked about how they did it as often as they did it. Paul said in, in the book of uh, 1 Corinthians, they could choose. You don't have to do it the first day of every week. You can do it once a month, once a quarter, once a year. I like doing it more than not doing it. So in order for us to be giving ourselves to that time, I encourage some of you to do it at home, at your meals, when you have church family over, whatever your event you've got going on, take that time. Time. I believe they didn't wait till they were all assembled in the temple. I believe daily in every house and everywhere they went, when given that opportunity, they celebrated and remembered the Lord's death, burial, and resurrection through taking the Lord's Supper. It was an intricate part of their life. I wish we could do that more. I, I would love to come to your house and eat dinner and afterwards at some time take communion and we love and live around the cross, not just on Sunday, but on Saturday night when we get through with what we're doing and enjoying our fellowship. The third thing, uh, the fourth thing was they devoted themselves to prayer. And I believe this is a... A formula for success in your life in the kingdom of God. Not that everything will get better, but that God would get better in you and that through that the joy of the Lord would be in you and come out of you through prayer, the word, fellowship with each other, and the Lord's Supper, always remembering, always remembering what Christ has done. So we've been working on uh, what I call the model prayer, not the Lord's Prayer. The Lord's Prayer, I believe, is John chapter 17 where Jesus prays for himself for us and for those, for the for himself, for the the apostles at that time, and for those who would come. Matthew chapter six is the model prayer. This is how he is teaching us to pray. We ended up last time a couple. I said it's been several weeks ago because we've had some other things in between that. On give us this day the food we need. Every day we come to the table. Amen. Every day we come to the presence of God. We come into that place uh, with thanksgiving. All prayer is petition and praise. Praise and petition. It starts out with praise. It goes to petition. Then it goes back to praise. Then it goes back. to That's all it is. It's either praising God for who He is or what He's doing or what He's going to do or it's asking God for those things you need in your life. It is okay to ask God for what you need. I've heard people say before, I don't want to pray for myself. That's not scriptural. The scripture tells you to call upon the name of the Lord, to ask. And it tells you, in fact, in the scripture, as it teaches about prayer, it says, ask and it shall be given to you. And the tense there on ask of the verb in the Greek means to ask and keep on asking. It is a constant state of asking. So not only do you ask once, but you continue to ask for... I believe sometimes our prayers are not answered because we don't pester God until He does it just to get us <laughs> to, to, to back off from Him. Ask and keep on asking. Knock and keep on knocking. Seek, keep on seeking. Do not give up. Some of you are seeking God for some things in your life right now that you're fixing to give up right before the breakthrough comes. In due season, you will reap if you faint not. There's a whole lot of people in this lifetime that have fainted before the glory of God showed up at the place they were serving or in the house they were living in or in the marriage they were trying to fix or in the kid they were trying to raise and all of those things. Do not give up and keep on asking. And he says in verse number 12, and forgive us our sins as we have forgiven those 
who sin against us. Now we have to understand that we walk in a time where there is sin all around us. Is, are we sinful because of that? No. But is there a possibility in our lives if we take our eyes off God or we take our eyes off the Holy Spirit where we can be ensnared by the traps of Satan and do things that are subpar to the kingdom of God's standards that he has given to walk in. Now, how many of you have ever sinned? So all raise your hand or you'll be a lion and then for sure you've sinned, okay? So what about today? This guy from New York cut me off about Crossville today. And Tiffany said, he's from New York. I said, that makes him a double idiot. One for cutting me off and one from being from New York. <laughs> I shouldn't have said that. But a minute. It wasn't right, though. It wasn't right. So David actually says in the psalm that if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. It's the thing that puts the static in the line, like when you're on the cell phone and there starts to be a little bit, can you hear me? Can you hear me? I'm a part of the most drop calls network, Verizon. So every time I go down the road in Benton County, there's some kind of static. And I'm trying to figure out, why can't this person on the other side hear me clearly enough to understand what I am saying a lot of times it is because we are harboring some type of sin in our life that is not listen to me that is affecting our fellowship with God fellowship so I'm a child of God my father is God the father I have done what he said I've placed my faith in the person of Jesus Christ I relate this to my earthly father so my father is Doug Greer no matter what, whether he likes it or not, that's my dad, okay? When I was young, he did not like it. In fact, the night that I went to jail for doing that which they had warned me about that I shouldn't do for months and months and months, guess who still come and got me that night and took me home? My father. Now, hear me, he was still my father in the mess. In the good times and the bad times, I'm in a blood covenant. I'm in a blood relationship with the father. My father's Doug Greer. I can run off to the pig pen. This stuff is, he is my father. He doesn't like it. He doesn't like what's going on. But if I do these things, it puts distance between me and my father. And the relationship is not exactly what it needs to be at the time. I look at it like this. That night that I wrecked my truck. I woke up in the ambulance. Next move was a cop car. The next move was in the back of my dad's car. And for the next month at my home, my dad walked by me every day. And if you were raised like me, your house wasn't big enough to get away from anybody in. It was 1,200 square foot, which included all three levels. <laughs> so the hallway, when I say we walked by, I could reach you from one end to the other. For three weeks, every time I walked by my dad, it was this. And I didn't dare say anything. And I knew he loved me. And I knew that he had me. He had my best interest in me. I knew that I was, that, that was my dad. I knew that it was, but there was at some point I was going to have to say to him, Father, I need you to forgive me and open the lines of communication back that I myself had dirtied up. My father had done nothing wrong. My father had taught me right. He, my dad had lived a righteous example. I had never seen from my childhood to that day, I'd never seen my dad put his lips on a bottle of alcohol. Never. Like he was the laughing stock of his family because he wouldn't drink and everybody else was getting drunk. It cost him his family. My dad's the first one in five generations that's not a raging alcoholic making whiskey in their own home and trying to sell it for profit. My great uncle shot his son-in-law in the chest with a double barrel shotgun over whiskey. I'm talking about this was a curse in my family and my dad decides I'm going to break the curse. My dad breaks the curse and is doing everything he can to raise me right and I mess up and I cause division between me and him. What am I going to do? Am I going to sit on my side and sit on my, his side till he gives in? Or am I going to give in? No, I'm going to say, one day I met him in the barn. I went in there. You ever been to the barn before? There's a room in the barn. 
I guess we didn't have a woodshed. We had a barn, so... There's a room in the barn that if you was in the yard when you caused the issue, you went in that room in the barn, you know, and there's a room in the house that you went in. So I went into that barn. I met my dad, and I was like, hey. He just looked at me. He said, you got something to say to me? I said, I don't know what the big deal is. That's the wrong thing to say. <laughs> wrong. I, I've got a whole lot of what not to do's in my life, okay? So if I'm going to write a book, it's not going to be a self-help. It's going to be a don't do. You see what I'm saying? What? I don't know what the problem is. That was three weeks ago. He said, you don't know what the problem is. You, you don't know what the problem is. I've worked hard all my life to give you everything you want, and I have done without so you can do with. And I couldn't afford to give you that truck I gave you, which it wasn't, it wasn't much, but in a family that my dad buys a $600 truck and drives for the next three years and pour two quarts of oil in it a week just to get back and forth to work to pay for the junk truck that I'm driving that's not as much junk as the one that he's driving, it was a big deal. Here I am doing everything. I've put everything. I have laid the table. I have made the crooked path straight. I have set the example before you. And you don't know what the problem is? You don't understand what's going on here? Son, all I want you to say is, I'm sorry. That's all I want from you. For once in your life, just admit that you're wrong. Y'all, nobody's ever had this conversation before with their parents, I know. You will. And I told Tiffany on the way home from Knoxville Day, I pray to God that my kids don't give me the trouble I gave my parents. Yeah, praise. Y'all better be praying. Yeah, we're going to start fasting about this from now till they're 27. <laughs> so my dad was just saying, just at, if, if all you had to do was sincerely, sincerely say, I'm sorry, Daddy. And all this would be done. And yeah, there's going to be some consequences because there's a truck in our yard that looks like a rainbow. And we're fixing to have to go to the courthouse and the judge and all of this. There's going to be some consequences for the seed you sow, but I'm not going to hold it against you because I love you. I, God says, God says these words, He is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness, if you'll just ask Him. See, pride says, ain't nothing wrong with me. But being like God says, there's a lot wrong with me. And I'm in a mess here. It'd, be, it'd probably do good for... Some of y'all men to apologize to your wife. and Some of you wives to apologize to your husbands. And some of you kids to apologize to your parents. And maybe some of you adults to even apologize to your parents. Because honoring your mother and father isn't just for your kids. It's even for you no matter how year old you are and how old your parents are. You know, I mean, this, this transcends generation. You want to live a long life, then even honor your father and mother even when you've gone on up in years. God, please. That's why he's saying here, you want to walk around all the time knowing there's static between you and God? Or do you want to get up every day, crucify yourself, mortify the members of your flesh for the things I remember and the things I don't, God? I am sorry. True repentance is not just I'm sorry. Real repentance says, I'm not going to do that anymore. The only way to truly give forgiveness is to truly repent, which means to fully repent, which means to fully turn from what you're doing and go the other direction. So when you walk into the presence of God and you want to get forgiveness, you better make sure that you are willing to turn from that sin and go the other direction. It's not just about I'm sorry and then walking back into the same thing you've been doing for years. We get a whole bad rap in the Baptist church about, well, y'all just believe you can do anything you want and still go to heaven. I've never said that. I will never say that. And whoever told you that doesn't know what we truly believe. I believe that if you are living any way you want to live, then the Spirit of God is not in you. And therefore, you can call them lost or however they lost it. They didn't get it. Any way you want to look at it, they're not going to be where I'm I'm going to be one day because we don't once you get the spirit of God your want to's change 
You want to please God. You have walked from darkness into marvelous light. And the moment that something happens in your life that's not going to have, not supposed to happen, you go, why in the world did I do that? I've got to get back to where I need to be. God is too good for me, to, to me, and in me. He's, this is not what I'm supposed to be doing. If you can sin, listen, I get so tired of Christians who are supposed to be saved, never maturing in the walk that God has given. There's got to be some fruit, some maturation. Every seed that you buy at co-op says that it will mature in 90 days. In 90 days, if there's not some maturation, that's a dud. It's no good. I've been saved 45 years. Well, do something for the glory of God. Make a move towards Him. Quit messing everybody else up that's looking at you saying, well, if that's a Christian, well, if that's a child of God, I think I, I've, I'm as good. There's a whole world out here looking at the church going, I'm as good as the church. I, I live as good as they do. When we do all, when everything in our life looks like everything the world does in their life, and the only difference is the place we attend on Sunday, something is wrong. Something is wrong. When we mirror the world, and the only difference is the place where we go on Sunday mornings to make ourselves feel good about, that's what we really do not have. It has become a fake and a facade, and the reason the church doesn't walk in power is because the devil has fooled us into believing that we are all saved. When Billy Graham, even years ago, said that I don't even believe that 90% of the church is saved because saved people pray prayers like this and say, I'm sorry, God, and I'm not just going to keep on keeping on doing the mess that I'm doing. I'm going to quit and I'm going to walk for the glory of God. We've got to change the way we live our lives. I don't know what it is for you, but even in the book of Romans, it says, lay aside the sins and the weights that hold you back. All of us have something we deal with. And it, right now, you might be getting victory over that very thing God's giving you victory over, but when it gets victory time in that arena of your life, something else is going to pop up. It's like getting your face clean. You think, well, I've got everything good, and then something else pops up. It's just the way it happens in life. You think, I've got this whip. Just keep laying aside. Keep laying aside. Just keep laying aside. And then it says that thing that's holding us back, there are things in your life right Right now that might not have you might not have to ask forgiveness for that sin but it is holding you back from being in what God would have you to be I think about that all the time Paul said um, all thing, all things might be lawful for but not all things are beneficial there's some things in your life you're doing right now that it's okay to do but it is keeping you from reaching your full potential in Jesus the Christ and in the world that He's called you to live in. There's some things that your flesh desires that aren't wrong, but they're not beneficial. And if they're not beneficial, then you crucify your flesh and you walk down that road. If there's sin in your life, you confess it and you forsake it. And you do this on a daily basis, every day. Wake up right with the Lord and go to bed right with the Lord. Make sure it is in your mind and your conscience that God wants us to live a holy life. And I think it's not, listen, Christianity is not a superior morality to the rest of the world. It is God in us, that hope of glory, the Jesus righteousness imputed to us, and then that is lived out on a daily basis. And what is, when then what is, whatever's coming out, if it don't look like Christ, then we kill it as forgiveness and we go on becoming like Him, preordained before time to walk in good works, is what Christ says in the book, uh, what Paul says in the book of Romans. So you have, when you get saved, been given a path and a plan forward that God has preordained before you get saved that you might walk in good works. That's the whole deal. Now, at some point, the things you are supposed to do 
should outnumber the things that you're not supposed to do. Sometimes the scale needs to start flipping in your life as you mature in your Christianity. What I'm trying to do is encourage you to not stay in the place that you've been. If you're not in a good place right now, realize it. Confess it. Forsake it. Move to the next place. If you've been a Christian all your life and you've backslidden, you've done something you shouldn't do, you've gotten cold on God or apathetic or, or whatever, complacent in your Christianity, Christianity, make a move. Ask God to forgive you of that. At one time you was on fire, but now you can't even smell the smoke anymore. You've been so wet over the past few. Just make a move towards God. He's faithful and just to forgive you and to cleanse you and to propel you through the power of the Holy Spirit towards that which He's called you to do. Don't sit and wallow in your sin. Don't sit and shame yourself. The devil is shaming you. God does not shame you. Good pastors don't shame you. They just give you the truth and you either walk in it or you don't. God doesn't shame you. He says, you know the truth. If you love me, if you love me, do what I tell you to do. If you really loved me, like, man, that's the measuring stick when I get out here and, and all this mess is going on in my life. You really find out what you love in life when you see how you're living. You really see the, the things in your life that mean the most to you, the priorities, the preeminence. That's why God says, seek you first the kingdom of God, making sure we give Christ the preeminence, which means the first place in us. We really see what we love if we really love God. We confess and forsake because we know not only have we sinned to God against God, but there's those who, we're all the same. Amen? So if I hurt you, forgive me. And if you hurt me, I'm going to do the same. Here's what I like to think about. When I went through my divorce, my wife had left with my best friend on earth. And I was praying. I said, God, I don't know how in the world I'm going to deal with this the rest of my life. I don't know how in the world I'm going to forgive him for what he's done for me. I was more mad at him than I was her. You think about this for just a minute. God said this words in this office right here. He said, you forgive her as much as I've forgiven you. What do you do with that? You forgive. God, forgive me. How many times have you ever asked God for forgiveness where he didn't forgive you? He's forgiven you every time that anything and everything you've ever done, God said, you're forgiven. In the same way he's forgiven us, we need to forgive those who've sinned against us. I don't know who that's for in here right now, but if you're holding a grudge against somebody or something or some church or some person, you better forgive them because forgiveness and unforgiveness are a big key in you being what you need to be. You've got to figure out a way that even if they don't ask for forgiveness, you've still got to figure a way to get that hate and that malice and all of that out of you because it is going to control you hating someone else is like this is what somebody heard somebody say one time hating someone else is like drinking poison expecting it to affect them hating someone else is like drinking poison in your own body and expecting it to hurt them you're going to hurt yourself and you're going to hurt your fellowship with the holy God when you hold things against people you hold listen you hold people's sins against them when you've done the same thing or worse towards a holy God who does not hold it against you what right do we have to ever not forgive somebody we never have the right to stand in judgment against somebody if God's not standing in judgment against us. If you are seen in Christ, seated at the right hand of the Father, then when God looks at you, He sees His Son positionally seated. I am in the heavenlies right now. God looks at me and He does not see my sin, but He sees my Savior. And when He sees my Savior, that means I'm forgiven because my righteousness is as filthy rags. And anybody who does anything against me deserves the same thing that I get from Him. I need to see Christ. 
Christ in them and the hope of what they could be and what God wants to do in them through somebody who knows Him acting like they should act towards that person. Unforgiveness will kill you. It will drag you down. These people all over the place who don't go to church because somebody hurt their feelings. There's people all over the place that don't believe in God or, 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 or families. You know how I many families and people I talk to all over the time that are mad at, I'm mad at her and I'm mad at him and she did this and he did that. Peter said, how many times should I forgive my brother? And Jesus made it very plain. He gave a few numbers out, but what he meant was there was an infinite time. You just keep forgiving till I come back and get you, okay? You just keep saying, it's okay. It's okay. Whatever you do to me, it's okay. Here's the honest truth. I can't let you affect my spirituality. When I harbor something in me, then I'm letting someone else besides God affect who I am spiritually. And I'm going to be right with God whether you are or not. I've got to, in my position, Always be right with God. I have chosen that no matter what you say about my preaching or my singing or how I dress or my white legs or any of that stuff, I have chosen I'm not going to be offended. I'm going to go home, love my God, love my wife and children. I'm going to pastor every day with my heart pointed towards Him and I'm going to pray for you when you don't like me. I cannot waste my time in offense. Offense is the number one tool of Satan to tear the church apart. I've offended God, I'm going to ask for His forgiveness. If you've offended me, I'm going to ask you, let's work past this. And if, if I've offended you, I'm sorry. And I mean that. If, if I have offended anyone in this room at any point in time, you understand that I would never, I would never purposefully do it. I would never set out in my, in my life, even when I didn't know God, I would not set out in my life to mess you over. It's one thing my dad taught me. There's one thing I can say about my dad. He might have been rough on me, but he's never done anybody wrong. My dad has been a man that was his... Ma Listen, he didn't have a lot of friends, but it wasn't because he messed everybody over. It was just because he chose to hang out by himself because everybody else wanted to just keep that drama stirred up. He wasn't going to be a part of that. He didn't, my dad was a no-nonsense type of guy. I'd be telling jokes. He'd be saying, shut up, boy. Ain't got time for all that. One thing he never did was do anybody wrong. And I promise, if I've offended you, I, I'm, I'm sorry. I did not mean to. We're going to get grace from God when we sin. Amen? Amen. Grace. Where sin abounds, grace much more abounds. That's what Paul said. You're messed up. God's still good. Mercy. Grace. The same type of mercy and grace we get from God, we're going to give to each other. Amen? I've done got Frank in trouble. They come up from the basement to get him. All right. Y'all better go, but hold on now. Y'all go ahead and go, but we got a couple prayer requests. I'm sorry. I, we're going to have to extend this service time. We're going to do it until 8.30 next time. But uh, Tim Hollinsworth. Correct? Sherry Hollinsworth's husband. Um, you know Sherry and Santana and them. He has found out that he has colon cancer. And um, they're trying to figure all that out. Uh, they, don't, they don't know exactly what it is right now, but they're going in. They don't know if it's just in the colon or spread. When are they going in? They're going in tomorrow morning. If it's bad, whatever happens, then Miss Sherry might not get to start school. It's going to be at least a week recovery after the surgery. So we're not, she's not going to get to start school. I mean, they're going to have to do some type of surgery, but we don't know the extent of that. But my dad, they, they told my dad he had cancer in 2001, clean bill of health two weeks ago, okay? Like God does things. And we believe in that. We believe that God is the God that heals. Right now. Still does miracles. When you need a miracle, you ain't going to get it from me. You're going to get it from God. Because he's the one working these things. We need to be praying for him. And I've also, 
uh, got a lady in the community who has contacted me. Her daughter is in uh, rehab, and she is asking for help. She has paid all of her. It's, it's not even actually her daughter. Uh, you know this lady very well. She would not call us if she just reached out to us. She doesn't even go here, but she said, I, I know y'all work in this arena, and if, if y'all can give me any help. And she's $800 short. So what I'm going to ask you to do, if you've got any ability, and I talked about Sunday, we want everybody off drugs. We're going we're gonna to have to put them through treatment. We're going to have to be the hands and feet, money in the wallet. Here, go get what you need and come back and be what you need to be. So we need to pray for Tim Hollinsworth, and we need to take up some money for this lady. And this will be uh, a, a Jesus deal as we do that. Uh, last I heard, she was about $800 short. If we take up more than we need, we'll put it in the Hope Center Fund where we're going to work out of. We've got uh, a lady in the Hope Center right now. I had another Hope Center call today where a lady is about $450 short. We're going to try to meet some of that need. Uh, Jesse, Jesse come out of the Hope Center. Jesse's doing good. He's working. God's praise God. And for Jesse's life, we thank the Lord. Amen. And his testimony. So... Uh, we need to think, if you can do anything in that area, please come to me. I'm, we're going to put it right in the bank. We'll write them a check. Nobody gets any cash. We'll, put it, we'll write it right to the ministry. So if you'll bring that to me tonight, if you got it, just whatever we can do, and we'll do some from the church also. But, uh, but we need to be that hands and feet. Any, any other prayer requests? Beth Douglas, she spoke today. Pray for Beth. Her fevers went back up. Okay. Anything else pressing tonight? Yeah, Carolyn Woodard's been sick for a week, and the doctors are saying it's a virus, but it's more severe than a virus. Um, my wife's uncle, he went in today for surgery, and they're testing it to see if it is cancer or what it is. Um, so be praying for Larry. All right. Jesse's got a family member. Anybody else? Amen. Jerry Arnold. Be praying for him. Phil Marks. Phil Marks got cancer. He did get a kind of a good report. They said if that, that a lot of people live a long time and that they can work. It wasn't as bad, but it is bad. And anytime you hear that word, it, it does mess you up. Nikki Ames, Hames, okay, all right. No, I don't have a report on Wallace. I checked today and nothing new anyways. He's still taking treatments but not doing good. My dad is going to have to have a sinus surgery in August, so continue to pray for him as he has to have the surgery because his body can't kick this sinus deal with the cancer going on. Pray for Ricky and Victor. Amen. Y'all, a lot of you know Ricky and Victor. They've been here several times over the past few years. Amen. Yeah, West Virginia team. We're going to get them together and get them to give us a pep talk about what God did there. I'm already starting to organize things in the community, being hope in the community, trying to put some feet on the ground and actually community initiatives got some minds we're fixing to meet together to see what we can actually do to bring up hope restored restoring hope i don't know we're just god's fixing to do some on the ground stuff here with us i believe we're god's shifting some things and and i believe uh we're fixing to make a splash for the kingdom of god not for us for the kingdom of god it's about the kingdom of god it's not about us anybody else school starts in a week praise the lord Oh, that wasn't, oh, all right. Anybody else? All right. Anything else? Miss Melissa? Amen. Praise the Lord. Yeah, she was a very sick lady. 
All right, let's have a word of prayer. And then the kids are waiting on you. I'm sorry to keep you so long tonight. But uh, just if you've messed up, ask God to forgive you. That's exactly what he'll do. And if somebody's wronged you or you've wronged them, let's make that right. You can't be right this way, up and down with God, if you're not right this way, across the aisles with each other, in our communities with each other. God, thank you for this time that you blessed us with, Father. And God, we are sorry for that which we've done against you, that we've broken your laws. We've done things that we shouldn't do, God. And we do not flippantly ask for your forgiveness, but God, we ask you to show us through the power of the Holy Spirit that light that needs to shine in our lives into every aspect of our life, God, that we might truly be what you'd have us to be. Help us shun sin and, and, and lead us not into temptation. God, help us stay away from that which would draw us down the things that we might be drawn to at certain times and certain places in our life. Help us, God, just to see those things before they come and even see the way of escape because you, Father, uh, Jesus, you were tempted in all ways as we are, yet without sin. God, we know that you give us a way of escape. So, Father, let us see those places and those things and, and those attitudes that we can have that keep us from walking in disobedience. God, forgive us where we failed you and forgive us where we failed each other, God. If there's any relationships in this room or in this community that needs to be restored from this room, God, I pray that us as we are here, God, would not be known as people who do what we want to do or, or, or be what we want to be. And, and it doesn't matter about anybody else God that we will be right with each other and as the scripture says we'll live as peaceably as we can with all those around us God forgive us and God I ask special uh, requests God for Tim Hollinsworth God we have no clue we've just heard the cancer word God and we know that that strikes fear in the heart of all those who hear it God but we know that Father you have never feared anything God, you didn't fear Satan when he tried to overthrow you. God, you cast him out. And God, just like you cast Satan out of heaven, you can cast this disease out of Tim's body. So, Father God, I pray in Jesus' name that you would just let healing flow through him, God. That it would completely rid him of all cancer. And that when these doctors would go in there, what they did see... Not what they thought they saw, but what they did see, they would see no more, God. We pray a miracle in his life that truly there would be a report from a doctor that would say there was cancer, but there is no more. We can't explain it. That your glory might be seen in all of this, Father God. That your glory, and I pray for Sherry. I pray uh, for their son. I pray for Santana, God. I pray that there would be a peace that passes all understanding, God. That they would know you're there. Father, they would feel your presence. That they know you're never going to leave them that you'll never forsake them and that when their burden gets too heavy God that you've said to cast our cares upon you for you care for us God and that you yoke up with us God and you carry that load thank you Jesus that you're going to carry that load for that family just like you've done it for my family for 16 years now God you've never let us down and you've always been good and Father God I know you're going to do the same in their life God show yourself strong and in in the face of Miss Carolyn Woodard's trouble and Nikki Hames cancer God and, and for all those who we've heard the issues here uh, Jerry Arnold and Jesse's uh, family member and Phil Marks and, and, and God the, the ones that I'm missing God right now that you would just turn your Holy Spirit loose in their lives that the healing virtue would flow from heaven God and they would be able to show your glory to all the earth let the lost see that you are still alive and that you are still the same God yesterday today and forever that you change not God sweep through those bodies and cleanse them in the name of Jesus we pray these things and we ask you God just let us leave here tonight right with you and right with each other father for we know we have to link up with each other to do the work you've called us to do in this community father God we love you and we praise you and we worship you in between now and the next time we meet God let us all be very vocal about our savior and let us impact the darkness with this marvelous light that's within us in Jesus name we pray Amen.